Uh, we're going to be continuing on, like I said, in our Advent series. Uh, we're going to be talking about the good news, the good news of love. Uh, this love that is going to be expressed is uh, a love that we need to be able to define. Um, the, the definition of love uh, gets um, thrown around a lot. We're going to dive into that today. Uh, but first I want to start, I think it's appropriate if we start in Exodus chapter 34. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 34. And we will get started this morning. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you've given us the opportunity to gather together to be in your word. Lord, I pray that as we walk through the scriptures that talk about your love and who you are, Lord, that we would understand that, God, you are above all things, that you are creator over all things, that you are king over all things, that you are God, that you are supernatural in your being, that you are beyond anything that we can comprehend and Lord, we, we just trust and obey and seek your understanding through your word. Lord, I pray that as we, we go through it, that you would be glorified and honored in your precious name, we pray. Amen. In Exodus chapter 34, starting in verse 5, it says this. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, that being Moses, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So here in the book of Exodus, we, we have this, this almost this primer about who God is. That the Lord, the Lord, it's repeated, is a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. It goes on to then say that that steadfast love and faithfulness is forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but that justice will remain. We've talked about that uh, before as we've been going through the minor prophets, that part of the way that God loves is that he's just and that he, is, he will deal with sin and, and, and transgressions justly. And just as a loving parent disciplines their child, God will at times discipline his children. But his love, his steadfast love is eternal and it's part of who he is, that, that he is Lord, that he is merciful, that he is gracious, that he is slow to anger, and that he is abounding in love. You see, we use, the word, we use words to describe meaning to things, to uh, ascribe meaning to concepts, to ascribe meaning to feelings uh, and other terms. We do this because words have meanings. Words have definitions. Words have implications and consequences. Some words and their meanings have stood the test of time, while many others have changed because of cultural shifts, targeted efforts to shift meaning to meet a desired end, as well as faulty understanding of context. Words and their definitions today can even change from day to day. A word can mean one thing today, and depending on who and how it's used, might have to be changed so it means another thing tomorrow. We see this actually happening. When scripture is translated, though, into different languages from the original text, one of the most difficult tasks is to try and understand and ascertain the meaning of a word or phrase in its given context, be it historical, literal, or authorial. When we talk about love, We are talking about a word that biblically has multiple meanings in the original language of Scripture, depending on how it's used. When talking about God and us, we need to understand the major differences between the love that comes from God, which is a supernatural, beyond the natural law, holy, and without fault or corruption, and then the love that we attempt to express— which is naturally bound by natural law and corrupted by sin. You see, we use the term love, we use the word love, we use the concept love, we use the emotion of love differently than God does. And the reason is that is because he is God and we are not. 
God has a, a level of love to where he is love, as we're going to look in the scriptures. But how do we, humanity, see and use love? Culturally, love has been used as a catch-all to describe emotions, define relationships, express desire, show loyalty, demand tolerance, and much more. We use love as a way to convey many things. The problem with humanity and love is the same problem humanity has with everything else this side of glory, and that is sin. Sin corrupts our ability to love with a pure heart. It deceives us into thinking that as long as we're seeking love, we can't go wrong. Troves of songs and movies and cards and holidays have been made to express this idea of love. There's even the song, All You Need Is Love. Cultural movements have been, made, have been powered and fueled by this word, love. Um, we had the whole sexual revolution of the 50s and 60s where love was, didn't cost you anything. It was free, free love for all. It's just love, man. Yeah, I, I, I researched that, don't worry. But this idea that love, the word love is, is powering and fueling movements. The most recent of movements has shifted from the term God is love to love is love. The first was a hijacking of the biblical truth, God is love, by replacing the supernatural biblical definition of love in 1 John 4, 8, which we'll get to, with the natural earthly understanding of love, which is temporal, carnal, and, and corrupted by sin. By doing this, they could make the claim that all love, no matter the context, is an expression of God. This has shifted to now love is love where God is removed entirely and thus means that love expressed in any context is valid and then is accepting of any further expression, no matter the context. And so in the, their definition, love then knows no bounds, but their love is not rooted in true objective love. It's, it's relative love, not relative like I love my my brothers and my sisters, but like relative in that whatever you want goes, whatever I want goes, you live your truth, I'll live my truth, you do love your way, I'll do love my way. All you need is love, right? The reality for the Christian, for those who would claim Christ though, is that words have meanings. And the work of biblical understanding and interpretation in that work, context is king. As we see in Exodus, there are many words that describe who God is. And oftentimes we talk about these things as the attributes of God. Theologian and author Tim Challies gives us a good start in studying the attributes of God. To study God, he says, to study God's attributes is to study his character. To answer questions like, who is God? And what is God like? A typical classification of God attributes divides uh, God's attributes, divides them into those that are incommunicable, those that he does not share or communicate to anyone or anything else, meaning those are the attributes that are God's and God's alone, and then communicable, those that he shares with other beings. Like most theological classifications, this one is imperfect but still helpful as we seek to understand what is so far beyond ourselves. God's communicable attributes can further characterize into attributes of God's being, God's mental attributes, moral attributes, attributes of purpose and summary, attributes, attributes that in more particular way modify each other. It is important to consider that God is not simply the sum of his attributes. His attributes are not separate from one another, but each one modifies or qualifies each of the others. And so that God's love, when we talk about God is love, his attribute of love is directly tied to his holiness. That his love is holy, meaning that it is uncorruptible, without sin. It is perfect. That his justice, that he does justice in love. That his love expressed is fair and right and true. You see, when we say God is love, we must never think that his love is more important than his other attributes. The theology of God tells us that God's love 
never operates apart from his holiness, mercy, justice, omnipotence, omniscience, or any other attribute that he has. Some theologians describe God's attribute of love as a central attribute, meaning that all of his attributes come out of this, this one or are so in, 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 con, interconnected with his love. The biblical definition of God's love is deeper than we often imagine. To, me, today, many affirm the truth, God is love, but live as if the Bible did not demand us to love even the most unlovable. If we turn to Luke chapter 6, we're going to be bouncing around the Bible today, so I like doing that. Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 32. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Remember, love is love. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is to you? For even sinners do the same. Those who are unregenerate, those who don't claim Christ, they can be good to each other. We call that common grace. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. Verse 35. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. You see, we struggle with this idea of, of biblical love because it means that we have to love people that we don't want to love. And we struggle with that because of sin. We struggle with that because we would rather see our enemies face wrath rather than God's grace. We often then struggle um, with the fact that God reserves a special salvific love for his people alone. Yet if we are truly to reflect God's character with self-sacrifice, we must love Christ's people and strive to show love to even those, quote unquote, unworthy of it both inside and outside of the church. It is the biblical definition of God is love that helps us to see the good news of love and its manifestation in the fulfillment of Christ and it indwells in the believer through the Holy Spirit. So let us turn now to 1 John chapter 4, where we are going to work to define what biblical, this idea of God is love and what, what that means biblically. So turn to John, 1 John, sorry, 1 John chapter 4, Starting in verse 7, we're going to read through verse 14. John says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not, who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his Holy Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That means the payment for the just penalty of our sins. Verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. And if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. God's love, God, the term God is love, the, in verse 8 that we see, God is love, does not mean God equals love. For that would insinuate that love then equals God. The love that comes from God, because that's what that means, that God is essentially the essence of love, what love is to actually be. The love that comes from God to his people is rooted in his affection for and benevolence towards his creation. We understand God's love is foundational to each of his attributes as we've talked about before. You see, the word for love found in verse 8 that says God is love 
actually means affection and benevolence. God is the meaning of having pure, holy, uncorrupted affection for his creation. God loves his creation and has affection for it. The idea of this affection is kindness. He looks on his creation and he has kindness towards what he creates. He shows kindness to his creation. This is good news for us. In addition to his affection, he has benevolence. And again, this idea of affection is different from the worldly affection, right? When we have affection, a lot of times our affections are tied to lust, right? We talk about David and Bathsheba. He had affection for Bathsheba, but that wasn't okay, right? Because he was corrupted with sin. His affection for her was, was carnal. God's affection for us is pure and holy. And so it's different than what we use it as. When God says he loves us and that he sent his son to die for us because he loves us, that love is not the same love that we express on Valentine's Day. It's not the same love that we can even express to our spouses. I can say I love my wife with all my being and all my heart, but the reality is is I love God more because that's what Scripture commands me to do. And because my wife can't save me, Only God can. But I love my wife, and I can express and have affection for her, and I can, as the scriptures say, love her as Christ loved the church, and so my actions towards her can be very biblically affectionate and in line with biblical affection. But ultimately, I'm going to fail her because I am a sinner. There's going to be times where I don't love her perfectly. There is never going to be a time where God doesn't love and have affection for his people perfectly because he is holy. There's never a time where Christ's death and sacrifice, the love that he showed on the cross, will ever fail us because it is perfect and holy. So again, the second part of the understanding of the word God is love is his benevolence. Benevolence literally means good will or good purpose. This would be in contrast to an evil will or purpose, which would use the word malevolence. God has a good will and purpose for his creation in which he has great affection for. This love is manifested for us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. God's affection for his creation to redeem us back into himself, then was manifested, that benevolence, his goodwill and purpose for his creation was manifested in the person and work of Christ. And when we receive this love through Christ, it is then sealed by the Holy Spirit and we are able to have the capacity to love as God has loved us through Christ. We get to share in that act of love with the world. We begin to have our hearts changed to having affection for ourselves to having affection for others, from seeking our own will and purpose to submitting to the good will and purpose that comes from God. As we abide in the love of Christ, we produce the fruit of love towards others and have assurance of our salvation in Christ. John, earlier in his gospel, spoke of this abiding love in his gospel. So let's go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15 Starting in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you, much, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. We'll probably be talking about that verse next week. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love, again, this idea of a greater love, the biblical love, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for, I, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that wherever you ask the Father in my name, it'll be given to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. You see, we are, we are to th- this abiding in Christ, this abiding in this affectionate, benevolent love that was manifest in the person and work of Christ, and we get to share in that through the grace that we receive by faith in Christ, that love, then we get the opportunity to express and point to the biblical work of love to others. We are to love others by pointing them to Christ. John states that love is a fundamental mark of those who have authentic faith. If one who loves has been born of God and knows God, if you look back at um, chapter 4, verse 7 of 1 John, then the one who does not love has neither been born of God nor does he know God. God is love, again in verse 8, that is, love is essential to God's nature. If we truly have become partakers then of that nature, and increasingly reflect God's holy and loving character if we become more Christ-like in our obedience to his commandments and his word, then we will have no choice but to love other people. Our transformed hearts will inevitably respond to God's call that we love others as he loves us. We will endure to love and endeavor to love if we have ever been born of God. And we will repent when we find ourselves not loving as he has commanded. And so part of the question there is, have we been loving as God has commanded us to love? Have we been loving as Christ loved us? Have we been sacrificing for others for their benefit to see Christ more? Or have we not been doing that? Have we been, instead of showing love, have we been showing anger and resentment and hatred and bitterness? Or have we actually been showing the love of Christ that saves people from hell? That points people to the manifestation of the affectionate and benevolent love that is God made manifest in Christ. You see, when we do these things, when we work through those things, What we see is we see that God works, that it becomes a testimony to what God has called us to be a testimony to. Go back to 1 John. First John chapter 4, starting in verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love that God has for us, God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So what we have here is we have John repeating himself in a later time. Verse 17, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because he is also, as he is so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us, and if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has, not, has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. 
And this is the commandment that we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And so we have further discussion about the fact that we are to love others, not hate others. Can we say we love God and hate somebody else? We may not agree with them. We may not like them necessarily. We may, not, we may struggle in our relationship with them. But if we hate in the hate that, that Jesus would say would be malice and actually murder towards that person, do we hate people? Or as Christians, do we have the mark of being loving to people even if we feel that they're unworthy of that love? That's a hard thing. That is a hard thing. It's a hard thing to love those who we are angry with or disagree with or struggle with. But again, when we struggle with that, we need to come to repentance. We need to follow the commandment that we have that whoever loves God must also love his brother. We must love not only those outside the church that we struggle with, we need to love those in the church that we struggle with. We're to seek reconciliation. We're to seek good relationship. Verse 18 talked about that there is no fear in love, that, that we should not be afraid or have fear if we are trusting in the affectionate, benevolent love of God. We should have, again, hope and faith and joy and peace, all of the things that we talk about during this time of year. These should be our, our, our pillars that sustain us, not just this time of year, but throughout the entirety of our Christian walk. And so with that, this, this, this love that comes to us, this affectionate, benevolent love that is God, that comes to us through the manifestation of the person and work of Jesus Christ, that commands us then to share that love with others and not harbor hate towards others, but rather have the same affectionate, benevolent type of love towards others, will then give us confidence to do the, that exact thing to overcome the world, the world that would say love, love is an emotional thing and, and love can, can be in any context, in any expression, and it's okay. No, it's not okay. Because love has a very specific meaning. 1 John chapter 5, let's continue. Verses 1 through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we've lo we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who, it, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God? You see, we have confidence in the work of Christ for salvation. This is why we celebrate communion. We point back to it because we have confidence in it. And we want to remember it because it is our salvation. As we love God, we love those who are members of the family as well as those who are outside of the church. The love of God as expressed in biblically should be the hallmark of the church. But yet we would want to say that, you know, if we want to express love, we got to go to Hallmark. Now, the reality is, is we should be, we should be the ones oozing out pithy, <laughs> pithy love statements towards one another, because we should be the Hallmark of love, because we have, we, we have the ability to point to a God who is love, perfect love. We should be the highest examples of God's love being expressed in relationships by the relationships we have with one another and that we have with those outside of the church. The truth is, because of our sinful pride and ego, we often have division that hinders our witness of God's love. But he says here in Scripture, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. The commandments of God are not burdensome to those who love God and are his children. We delight in the law of God as the standard by which we live with each other and with the world. Often it is our biblical illiteracy that prevents us from knowing and following God's commandments. 
Oftentimes it's because we're not reading our Bible, that we're not seeking to know what God said about himself, that we struggle to follow his commandments and therefore love him wholly and fully. Through God's love, we have overcome the world. We have overcome the world because Christ has overcome the world, that Christ has victory over sin and death. We should have confidence. The grace that we have received by faith is victory over sin and death. And I'm reminded then of the hymn that says, His banner over us is love, our sword the word of God. We tread the road the saints before with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like whirlwind's breath swept o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. O oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. You see, we have confidence in the love of God because God is love. We have confidence in the affectionate, benevolent love of God that is God, that comes from God through Christ to the world, to us. Let's continue on. 1 John chapter 5, uh, verse 6. We're going to read this passage and, and close up. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood and the Spirit, is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, that he is born concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony of God, that God gave us eternal life and this life in his Son, that whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Our confidence is, is in the testimony of Christ. John asks the following question, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? This affectionate, benevolent love that comes from God is for his people. And it comes through Jesus Christ. So no other form of love, no earthly form of love, no earthly love that would want to seek a uh, earthbound utopia, any sort of love movement, love is love, love is free, whatever it is, all of it will fail to try and reach God or try and reach holiness. Because the only thing that overcomes the world is Christ. And we get to overcome the world because we are in Christ. You see, the answer that he explains is no one can do that. It is only the affectionate, benevolent, holy love of God that can overcome sin and death, overcome injustice, overcome evil, overcome unfairness, overcome our worship of the self. You see, but if we just love, we can overcome all of the problems in our world. No, you can't overcome the problems of this world with your love. Only Christ's love can overcome sin in this world. The world's corrupt view of love is no testimony we should receive. So no bumper sticker that says love is love, no free love movement, no, no earthly bound structure or testimony about love is something that we should receive. The testimony of the love that comes from God is Christ. From his baptism, his shed blood on the cross, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is the only testimony about God's affectionate, benevolent love that brings eternal life through Christ that is for our salvation and for the salvation of the world. 
It is the only testimony that we are to receive. It is why he came as an infant king to live the life we could not live, to die the death we deserve so that we could have life and have it eternal. And not just us, but for those who he would call us to then take the testimony to, to love others as Christ loved us, to bring the affectionate, benevolent love that is God that was made manifest in Christ to the world so that they may see what true love is. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that you loved us so much. Lord, that even, even in the fall, you, your, you, your plan of redemption was rooted in Christ. Lord, we thank you that you have affection for us as your creation. Lord, we thank you that you are benevolent, that you have a good will and purpose for us. Lord, I pray that we would repent of sin, of, of hatred or, or malice or ill malevolence towards others, Lord. Help us to, rather than have malevolence towards other people, evil will and purpose towards other people, help us to show the benevolence that you have given us to others. Help us to love as you have loved. Help us to be a testimony to the love that was expressed and made manifest in Christ. Lord, we thank you for this and all things in your precious name we pray. Amen.